Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Demystifying Machine Learning, Driving Image Analysis Using Your Biological Knowledge. I am Marie Stone of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Leica Microsystems. To learn more, visit leica-microsystems.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. This webinar is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education window at the bottom of your screen to obtain your credits. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Dr. Quinn Tran, Applications and Marketing Manager for Avia at Leica Microsystems. And joining us for our live Q&A session, Hoyan Lai, Content Marketing Manager and Senior Applications Specialist for Avia at Leica Microsystems. Dr. Tran, you may now begin your presentation. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this webinar, and thank you very much for joining us here today. My name is Quinn Tran. I am the Application and Marketing Manager for the Avia team here at Leica Microsystems. Today, uh, today's webinar will be about demystifying machine learning, particularly how to use machine learning to drive your image analysis using your own biological knowledge. So let's quickly take a look at our agenda. First, I'll be talking to you about how to leverage machine learning for your image analysis. We'll then dive into some machine learning fundamentals, and then I'll share with you some of my best practices for training a pixel classifier, a machine learning tool that we commonly use in microscopy image analysis. We'll then end with a Q&A session so that you have time to ask any questions you would like. So let's dive in. So I like to think about the ability to use machine learning in kind of two broad categories. First is image enhancement for microscopy images. Now I have four examples to showcase to you here, but I do wanna mention this is not an exhaustive list of ways you can use machine learning for your images. It's just the four that I commonly, use, uh, commonly see when I'm working with our customers. So the first example I have for you is this ability to extract multiple structures from a single channel. So here on the left-hand side in the original image, we have a stain that has stained the cell uh, membrane, the cell nucleus, and, cell, and also a bit of the cell cytoplasm. And for subsequent analysis, what we really wanna do is separate these three components into three separate channels. So we have the ability to um, tweak and, and analyze and optimize the image analysis protocol for these three components separately. So using the pixel classifier, the machine learning tool that I just briefly mentioned, we've essentially taught the software what each of these three components look like and then have separated them out. So now the cell membrane is in its own channel depicted here in the yellow. The cell nucleus is its own channel depicted here in the purple and the same for the cell cytoplasm depicted here in the red. So now when we do the analysis um, for these components, it's gonna be much easier because they're separated from one another. My second example here is going from a heterogeneous staining to a more homogeneous staining. And I think you can see that uh, heterogeneous staining best in this nucleus, um, this large nucleus down here. And basically because of the heterogeneity of this staining, it makes any image analysis we do that are intensity based very difficult. What's gonna typically happen is that instead of detecting this as one nucleus, it's gonna break this apart into smaller pieces, which is not what we wanna do because that's not represent uh, representative of the, uh, biological, um, the biological nucleus here. 
So using, again, the pixel classifier, what we've done is essentially even out the staining. So now the entire large nucleus has a more um, consistent uh, intensity level of the staining so that when we do image analysis, it's a lot easier to detect this as one whole piece. My third example is enhancing certain objects of interest in your images. Um, in this particular case, I'm showing you a histology image. And what we wanted to pull out or enhance is these regions and these cells that have this stain. And again, using the pixel classifier, we've done that. And that's depicted here in the yellow so that we're really pulling this information out and away from the background of the rest of the image. And then my fourth example is going from a phase to a fluorescent-like image. So here uh, we taught the pixel classifier to detect this um, neuron, both the soma and the dendrites here that are protruding out. And, cre and essentially creates a fluorescent-like image of this neuron, which allows you to do any subsequent image analysis at a much easier level because now you have an image that is really high, um, that has a really high um, signal or intensity of the neuron versus a low uh, signal for all of the other background components. Now, the other broad category I like to think about when it comes to machine learning and image analysis is the ability to go from the original image all the way to segmentation. So my first example for you here is segmenting cells in histology images. So this would allow you to do cell counting. It would allow you to do cell counting um, in certain regions of interest. Things like that are significantly easier to do now. The other example I have is segmenting cells in phase contrast image. So unlike the example we talked about just briefly, um, where we enhance that neuron, we're now going from this, the phase contrast image all the way to segmentation. This would make analysis such as cell counting or um, understanding cell confluency it, a lot easier for you in these um, types of phase contrast images. My third example for you is segmenting cells in fluorescent images. So here we have the scenario we, we spoke about earlier where the staining of the nucleus is heterogeneous. So it makes that a little bit tricky to do um, using traditional intensity-based threshold algorithms. So with the machine learning algorithm, we're able to kind of pull all of the, this together and detect these nuclei, um, nuclei in one large piece that is more representation of their um, of their biology here. The other thing I would I like to point out is um, when it comes to segmenting images, cells in fluorescent images, I also find the pixel classifier, classifier um, to be really helpful in detecting cells that are of an irregular shape. They don't have this round globular shape, which a lot of intensity-based algorithms are optimized for because that's the most common way we see our cells. Um, but when we have something irregular, those algorithms may not work the best. And I find that moving to a machine learning tool allows me to kind of be flexible and accommodate those irregular shapes, such as cells that are elongated or cells that have um, protrusions that you want to capture. All right, now let's talk about some machine learning fundamentals. And I typically like to start by looking at um, the traditional image analysis workflow and how that compares to an AI-based or machine learning image analysis workflow. So in traditional image analysis workflow, we human beings, the expert, create the rules. Um, rules such as my cells have to have an intensity level of 100 or above. My cells have to be in this particular size range. We take these rules and the images or the data and put it into the program. And the program provides us with answers. These are your detected cells. For the machine learning framework, we're essentially flipping that script. What we're going to provide the framework is examples or answers of what the cells look like, what the object of interest looks like feed the answers and the data into that framework, and the framework provides us with those rules. 
So again, those rules that we just briefly mentioned, cell size, cell morphology, cell intensity profile, the framework gives us the rules that make this cell or object of interest unique. So that, because of that flip, you might be asking, how does this actually work? What does it usually look like to train a machine learning algorithm? So this is a video showcasing you how the pixel classifier, a machine learning tool in Avia, gets trained. So in Avia, when we create a pixel classifier, we immediately get two classes, what you want and what the background. And then we provide examples. And this process is actually fairly simple because providing examples or answers is essentially painting pixels that make up what we want and then pixels that are considered background for us. So again, that providing of the answer part is actually fairly simple and it's just a painting method. The answers and the data is now fed into the machine learning algorithm, which spits out the rules and then the rules are applied to this image. So using that small subset of um, examples we provided, we create those rules and apply it to all of the pixels in the image. And it enhances each of the pixels. It classifies each of those pixels as what we wanted in the yellow or background, kind of in this gray or non-existent color that we've shown here. So again, we're feeding the answers by painting those examples in and the data into the algorithm and getting out the rules here. So let's take one step further and ask ourselves and talk about um, the algorithm that is behind this tool, which is the random forest algorithm. It's a, a fairly commonly used machine learning algorithm in the microscopy image analysis area. And if you use other pixel classifiers before, you've probably, um, it's probably running on the random forest algorithm. And what it's typically used for is the classification of pixels, what we just saw, or the classification of objects. So opt a classification of things of cell A versus cell B, for example. And the framework here is um, shown on the left-hand side. And essentially, it's composed of multiple decision trees that collectively pull together to give you an output that selects a class. Is this pixel belonging to your what class or does it belong to your, ran, uh, to your background class? So that's really the output of the random forest algorithm. Now let's take a further step into this and ask what's a decision tree? And it's essentially a type of supervised learning, meaning it requires an expert to help it with the learning process. And the whole goal of a decision tree is to make or pull together key features that really allows us, um, allows it to make the choice between what it is that you wanted or this is the background. So again, these key characteristics and these features are pulled together in one decision tree to decide this binary choice. So my kind of non-microscopy um, example here is um, somebody going in to get a loan and the loan officer you're working at, you're working with might look at some key characteristics um, to decide whether to give you this loan or not. It could be your age, your education level, you, whether or not you've been a homeowner before, your level of income, and these key characteristics or these key features allows them to make this choice, whether to refuse you the loan or to give you the loan. So we're kind of doing that in the same way with the microscopy data. We're trying to create a decision tree that pulls out the key features that make up your object of interest to decide whether this particular pixel or this particular object is what you want in versus what is considered background. So I've said feature a lot. What does this actually look like and what does this mean in microscopy images? So first of all, let's talk about why we do this. And essentially what it does is it allows us to describe the unique things and the unique characteristics of your object or your image. And this allows us to do it in a very systematic manner and one that pulls out these, these core features and these core components. 
So how does this actually happen? What, what do we do? Um, and the process essentially takes a number of image processing filters and applies it to your image, which transforms your image and enhance certain key aspects and certain key characteristics of the object that you're trying to detect and the object that you want. These transform images are then fed into the um, learning process to create the decision tree, to create the random force that we're looking at. On the left, on the right hand side here, I'm showcasing the uh, teaching features that are available in Avia. We have about 20 plus of them. Um, we have also kind of organized them to, into two um, categories for you, for anybody who's kind of starting out and don't really know which features would be best. We've organized them into good features for standard globular round shaped objects or for line shaped objects. So you can always start there within Avia. You also might notice here that there's a kernel size selection. So um, in this teaching process, are your images or your objects um, of a smaller size, of a larger size, um, things like that uh, are uh, possible to control in Avia too. And overall, the selection of teaching features and the kernel size is something that's typically available also in other pixel classifier tools. Now, I, because there are 20 plus, sometimes, sometimes even more um, of these features, I like to kind of think of them in general categories. It just gives me a good framework to think about which one may be critical to my objects and which one I might ex want to explore a little bit more. So the categories I think about here are zeroth order derivatives, which describes the original morphology of your image. We have first order derivatives that's really good at describing edges of objects, second order derivatives, which is good at describing curvatures. And in general, most of the tools available out there also have a set of what we consider a specialized feature that goes beyond the three categories we talked about that describes other more unique characteristics, such as really thin lines or something along those, those aspects. So let's take a look at what an example, what a zero order feature would look like. Um, I've chosen here the Gaussian blur for us to examine. And what happens here is we applied a Gaussian blur to the image at multiple scales. So on the right, I've applied it at a scale of a filter size of 10 and then a filter size of 50. Again, these transform images get fed into the training process. And what it's really good at doing is describing the intensity um, of your objects of interest at a local and regional scale. So that when you're looking at, for example, these um, large nucleus versus a small nucleus at size filter 10, you have a different intensity profile than you have at 50. And that might be crucial in um, classifying these pixels. And particularly if you wanted to classify a small nucleus versus a large nucleus, this might be one component that you might want to, to this might be one feature that you might want to use in your, um, in your training here. My second example for you is a first order feature, and this is the difference of Gaussian. What happens here is we apply two Gaussian filters with different sizes, and then we compute the difference between those two transform image to get, an, to get another transform image. And this is really good at describing edges, um, both on the local level and again at the regional level because we're using different sizes here. And you can see from the original versus the difference in Gaussian, the edges or particularly the cell membrane in this case is really highlighted. So this might be a critical feature for us to use when we're looking at a pixel classifier that is trying to amplify or to enhance the cell membrane and to decrease the um, signal from the nucleus in this image. So these are some examples of the types of features that are available um, and 
these two are typically used for these, uh, these purposes. But again, there's a variety of features that you can explore to find the best ones that work for what it is that you're, you're trying to enhance and you're trying to detect. So we've talked about a lot of components. Let's kind of pull it back together and, and talk about how does this all come together and how do you build this random force, um, the random force that's critical for your pixel classifier training. So the process kind of looks like this. So we take all of the data with the labels, with our examples, we break it up into random subsets of data. We then teach a decision tree based on these random subsets and a random selection of features. So now we have one decision tree. We then repeat this process. And because every time we repeat this process, we're taking a random subset of the data and a random subset of the feature, each of these decision trees are slightly different than one another. And what we're trying to accomplish here is all of these trees collectively together make a random forest that is going to give us the best classification of the pixels or the objects into what we wanted versus the background. So you can see from my description, um, that's kind of where the name random forest algorithm comes from, right? You're selecting a random subset of things to create a uh, series of trees to pull together um, to, to make this classification. All right, so let's kind of transition into maybe a more practical approach or a more practical way of, of looking at this. So now I kind of want to, uh, so now I want to share with you some of my best practices when it comes to training a good pixel classifier. So my first um, uh, best practices for you is to train with a variety of examples. Now, why is this important? So the machine learning algorithm to make an effective one, we have to be able to capture all of the critical rules, all of the critical aspects of the object that you're looking for. So if you don't have a variety of ways that your objects can look like, then the pixel classifier in the um, algorithm is unlikely to pull out the rules that you need. So what kind of things should you include? Um, again, this is not an exhaustive list. This is some that, that might be useful for you um, when you're doing this. So first is intensity distribution. So my example with this fluorescent image here, the distribution we see that was heterogeneous um, in the large nucleus versus the more homogeneous in the smaller nucleus. You wanna be able to capture both of that variation. We're also capturing here the difference in sizes. So if we only taught on the large nucleus, we might overlook and might not make the rules necessary to look for the smaller ones too. So you want to, you, you want to train and provide examples on both of these. You might also um, think about shapes and different shapes that your cells and your objects have and perhaps even other different characteristics. So down here in the histology image, what I'm trying to capture here with these arrows is I want to be able to detect areas with some dark staining, so a lot of staining, and areas that have lighter staining, because to me, those are still positive staining. So I want to make sure to provide examples of both of those scenarios so that the pixel classifier can learn that those two scenarios are what I want and what's important to me. My other best practice is to preview, preview, preview during the training process. Preview frequently and preview a lot in the training process. And why is this critical? For me, a lot of times the, the process of transforming the images with those filters makes it difficult for me to anticipate exactly how the example is going to affect the final pixel classifier. It's also important because sometimes I find that a feature might be really hard to pull out those rules exactly. So the pixel classifier might need a couple more examples and it's really hard to know how many examples. Um, so I like to preview to see 
what what's missing and what else to provide. So in this video here, I'm starting out with training on just these three kind of elongated and dark cells. And I'm previewing to see what that looks like. And I find that on my first, first preview, I'm not getting these round nucleus here. So now I'm gonna teach it on that. This last round, I'm finding that while I'm getting the round nucleus, I'm not getting the ones that are not super dark and super well stained. So now I'm including that. So basically during this previewing process, it gives me an idea of what's missing. What else do I need to provide to the pixel classifier to make the best one possible? So by previewing, not, I'm not only seeing what is being detected, but I'm seeing where things are missing so I can add just that component. It's gonna save you time and it's gonna basically uh, allow you to kind of just look at the results and not think about this entire transformation process and how things will affect the pixel classifier based on this transformation process. And my best third practice for you is plan for changes in the future. Um, I know as scientists, we, we typically encounter changes a lot. Our experimental conditions change, our imaging parameters change. You can um, never really plan for everything. Things happen. And so I like to kind of, in my pixel classifier training, plan for the fact that things are going to change. Um, so what happens in AVIA it's, but, uh, particularly is AVIA allows you to save what we call the PIX training data file. What that includes is a pointer to your original data and then all the examples you provided. So when you pull this PIX training data out, you have these two critical components to train the pixel classifier again. And it allows you to add in more data more train, uh, more examples to make the pixel classifier that you really need. So in my video example here, I started out training on a um, image that has a low cell confluency. I apply it to one that has a higher cell confluency and realize this isn't great. It's not picking up what I wanted to. So now I'm going to actually go in and add more training, add more examples, particularly from that um, higher confluency image. So with something like the PIX training data file, I can do that. And I don't have to necessarily plan and have the data up front when I'm training the original file. I always have the ability to go in and modify it later. So I always tell people, whether you think this is the best pixel classifier you've created and the one that you're always going to use, it's a good idea um, to basically have this pixel classifier, uh, this PIX training data file, just in case something happened. Just plan for things to plan, change, plan for the future, give yourself a little bit of a break because sometimes going back and training it from scratch is difficult depending on how how long and how difficult it is to create the pixel classifier training in the first place. So those are kind of my three best practices for you. Train with a variety of examples, preview constantly when you're changing, when you're training, and always have a plan for the future when things may or may not, when things may change for you. All right, with that, I would like to quickly summarize um, the presentation that you've seen today. I hope in this webinar you've seen that machine learning driven image analysis really allows you to leverage your biological knowledge in providing the examples to the pixel classifier instead of the rules. And by doing it this way, we have the capacity to add complexity to the analysis because the pixel classifier can provide you rules that you may not have considered or may not have thought about. But this complexity that you're adding to the analysis doesn't necessarily have to mean that you're adding complexity to your work. Um, the painting of examples make this fairly straightforward and a really easy way to, um, to basically do the image analysis. I also hope that you've gathered some um, useful tips and a few guidelines to keep in mind when you're doing um, 
machine learning pixel classification training and that the, these guidelines really help you to create a classifier that's very effective and really useful for what it is that you're trying to detect and trying to do in your research. I also want to let you know that Avia does have free trials. So if you've been curious or you want to try out the pixel classifier or any of the, the um, examples I've shown you, such as going from a face contrast image to segmentation, that's available in Avia and you can give it a try for free today. Just go on our website, um, avia-software.com slash demo to request your own free trial today. And with that, I want to say thank you again very much for attending this webinar. I hope you found it useful. Um, and now I'll be happy to take questions that you have regarding the, um, the information I presented today. I'm also going to go ahead and invite some of my colleagues to join me in this Q&A session just to provide me with a little bit support and resource so that we can make sure that all of your questions are answered. Again, thank you very much for attending today, and now I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you, Dr. Tran, for your informative presentation. We would again like to welcome Hoi and Lai as we begin the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is, does machine learning require a powerful computer? Um, yeah, so uh, for machine learning, you do not need a very powerful computer to run um, the pixel classifier. Um, you, essentially what we have implemented in Avia is that um, it will default to CPU processing when it does not have, uh, when a GPU power is not available, or say, let's say certain features actually do not have GPU acceleration, and that will also default into using the CPU as well. Of course, the performance will be a little bit slower compared to using a GPU, but otherwise, um, you do not need to have a very powerful machine to use uh, the pixel classifier. Thank you. Next question. Once I've trained a pixel classifier, can I apply it to multiple images? Uh, yeah. So well, with the pixel classifier, you can apply this uh, to multiple different images. What you have actually trained on with the pixel classifier is not specifically the information that is uh, uh, that is on that image that you uh, that you have, but rather the other information that is encoded. So um, that allows you to, as long as your experiment or your imaging condition doesn't change too much, you will be able to apply the pixel classifier to other images in your experiment. And of course, if you uh, do once you, when you apply the, the pixel classifier and you realize that it uh, wasn't performing as well as expected, you can also add those images to your training data set. So um, over time, you can build a much more robust uh, the uh, pixel classifier for your application. Thank you. Next question. It is possible to use the ML tools in my, is it possible to use the ML tools in microscopy images of mammalian, fish, amphibian oocytes or eggs? I wonder if development of different stages could be analyzed and recognized. What kind of image processing tools do we need to analyze that kind of those kinds of images? Um, so I'm so I'm going to assume that in this case we're looking at the development in the early um, in the early development cycle. Um, so in that case, yes, it is going to be possible to use the pixel classifier to analyze uh, these images. And um, the I, um, the one thing that we actually I um, that we can also do uh, with the pixel classifier is that um, for for instance, um, if you are looking at the different dermal layer organization, you just need to paint kind of the specific regions that you're interested in, and um, the pixel classifier will try to kind of identify those uh, those regions based on the information that you provided. So perhaps maybe for example, maybe in some cases the um, the nuclei are maybe a little bit smaller, or there is a a visible cleft in the data uh, on the image. So some of those things could also be picked up by the pixel classifier as well. Great, thank you. Next question. 
how do people document and share their pixel classification protocols? Uh, so, tip, um, yeah, so typically the pixel classifier, um, the, um, the file will be saved, uh, you will be saved to, to a specific file, and that you can take that and you can apply it uh, to other, um, you can uh, load it in uh, another copy of API uh, that your colleague has, or if you um, are just trying to train a pixel classifier, you can use ABI Community, uh, which is a, our version of the freeware, which allows you to load and train a full copy of ABIA to apply. And also Thank like you. in terms of documentation, sorry, sorry. Um, and then for documentation, um, the information about which feature gets used uh, is available and the pixel classifier as well. So when you select, uh, when you're training a pixel classifier, you can select which feature that it will um, that you want to apply uh, apply with, and that um, and and you can have that record as well. Great, thank you. Um, next question. Hi Quinn, thanks for the great talk. How does the perform? How is the performance assessed in Avia? Um, thank you very much uh, for for that comment and for the performance. I'm assuming. Um, we're talking about the the how well the pixel classifier detects the signal or the object of interest that you want. And that's really based on your review of the results. So kind of like how we looked at that video of the preview, or we can also look at the final results. You as kind of the expert is um, the person who will assess how well that pixel classifier looks and how well it performs. So once it's applied, you can uh, straight away look at what cells are detected and whether or not that fits your criteria for a good performance or not. Great, thank you. Next question. What is the minimum size of labeled data set that gives good performance? Ah, yes, we get this question asked a lot, and unfortunately, it's not one I can give you um, a black white answer on, basically. It varies quite a bit by what it is that you're trying to enhance or you're trying to segment. Um, as we saw in the example of the um, training process, it can be, you know, just a small region of interest. I have done this with just an example of a few cells, um, and I've done this where we've had to do um, a couple of previews and, um, and uh, you know, 10, maybe 15 examples and things like that. So it varies quite a bit, but that's one of the reasons why that preview functionality is immensely helpful, because you can look at it along the way and see how well it's performing and add just enough of what is needed to get a good pixel classifier. Um, so again, it, it really varies depending on what kind of image analysis you're looking for and the um, images that you're kind of starting out with. All right, great. Um, next question. How well does Avia play with other image analysis programs such as Fiji and file formats? So um, I'll take the file formats first. Uh, so for file formats, Avia can read a number of file formats. I can't remember the exact amount off the top of my head, but at least 15 kind of uh, file formats natively. So that's just us reading um, directly. For file formats that we don't cover, we do have a bridge with bioformat, um, a, uh, a script or, or kind of an application in Fiji that covers, I think they're up to like 400, maybe 500 file formats now. So there is that bridge if we don't cover the file formats that you need. Um, in terms of kind of um, how well it works with other programs, so AV is optimized for TIFF, um, which other programs such as Fiji and in general 
um, other image analysis, analysis program will work with. So you can um, basically save and import your, export your data into kind of a TIFF format and use other programs um, down the line if that's what you want to. Great, thank you. And we'll wrap up with that last okay. question. Thank you again, Dr. Tran and Hoyan, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Leica Microsystems, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.